and, and talk. Okay, so, uh, well, my name is Angeles. As I said before, I, I work at the Politecnico University of Valencia uh, doing single cell splicing analysis, and lately I've done a lot of work uh, regarding TAPAS, uh, which is the latest tool released by our lab to do what we call functional isotopic domics analysis. And so, to better understand the aim of, of TAPAS, I'm going to first explain what functional isotopic domics uh, is. So traditional expression analysis evaluates differential expression of the different isoforms of a gene between conditions and can provide this type of information about changes in the major isoform expressed in each of the conditions by a given gene. However, this approach presents a couple of limitations. First, it is not easy to systematically visualize the differences between isoforms that have been generated due to splicing regarding sequence and in addition, um, the biological readout of this expression analysis is kind of difficult to interpret because there is no way to know how these different isoforms uh, differ in biological function. So to make these two tasks easier for us, uh, we have designed strategies to incorporate functional elements into transcriptome annotation using isonant and isonant light, as Brian explained before. Uh, then, in TAPAS, we provide analysis that combine expression with these functional annotations, and this is what enables functional isotranscriptomics. And furthermore, using TAPAS interactive maps, we can visualize these features within the sequence, as I've been showing here, in order to understand functional differences between isoforms. So before we dive into TAPAS functionalities, I'm going to show you a brief example of how this works. So thanks to the functional notation, we know the correspondence between these isoforms on the left and uh, the different features, motifs, domains, et cetera, that they contain. Take for instance, this um, catenin delta gene, which is included, uh, it has this nuclear localization signal, and it is included in two of its isoforms and it's excluded in the other two. By combining the expression of the feature including and feature excluding isoforms, TAPAS detects a change in feature inclusion that is condition dependent, with NLS containing isoforms being favored in the oligodendrocyte condition and uh, the NLS excluding isoforms being favored in the neural condition. This is, in fact, a real example with real data um, that we validated in the TAPAS paper, if you're interested in reading it or if you already did. So although different approaches are implemented for different types of features, um, this is very same, the very same logic that we use in all of TAPAS analysis. And it's at the core of what functionalized like transcriptomics is. And now I'm gonna move on to describing how the application works. I'm first gonna talk about inputs and product creation. Then when we're gonna open TAPAS and I'm gonna show you how to create the project that we'll work with here in the hands-on. I'm gonna let you do that for a few minutes after I demonstrate. And while the project is being loaded, I'm going to give you a brief guide to TAPAS interface, and I'm going to talk about the different analysis options that we'll, we'll look at during the hands-on. So how do I create a project in TAPAS? In TAPAS? And first of all, what is a project? Projects are the main instance in which TAPAS is based, and a TAPAS project requires three main inputs, a design file, an isoform level expression matrix, and a functional annotation GFF3 file that can either be selected from those built in in TAPAS or provided by the user. The design file is a small text file specifying the names of the different samples and the conditions that they correspond to. In the case of this tutorial, we're going to work with this data set, which contains two conditions, which are neural precursors um, and oligodendrocytes. And it's very important to note that TAPAS requires at least two replicates per condition. Um, and that the sample names in the design file, which is in this column, in the sample column here, need to match the column names in your isoform expression matrix. Uh, importantly, in your input matrix, in your expression matrix, the isoform ID column uh, must not be named, and you should only include the different sample names matching those in your, in your design file. However, in this case, it, this is a two-group comparison, but this is not the only type of experimental design that is supported by TAPAS. Other available designs include single time course, which contains a single experimental group, but several observations across different time points and multiple time course with two experimental groups and a time dependent design for each of them. In this case, you must include a time column in your design file, which must contain the number uh, time points. And again, 
two replicates per, per time point in this case. And finally, TAPAS requires a functional annotation file in a compatible DFF3 format. Um, this corresponds to the output obtained after running 73 with the ISO not light argument. So before I go ahead and create a project, I'm gonna talk a bit about the overall design that you would need if you were to do a long read experiment yourselves uh, and to generate all these inputs. So this is just one possible way to do so. And this is a strategy that we routinely apply in the lab, even though there might be more than one valid strategy um, depending on the aim of your study, of course. So let's imagine that we have a two condition experiment in which we have neural precursors and oligodendrocytes from mice and three replicates per condition. To obtain long reads, one could pull cDNA from these different samples of the same condition and run different PacBio or Oxford nanopore uh, flow cells to obtain long reads from each of the conditions. Uh, to complement the information provided by long reads, uh, one could use the same cDNA to generate short read sequencing for each sample. Next, uh, what we recommend is to pull uh, long reads from both conditions prior to processing and then obtain um, a single transcriptome for your experiment using ISOSEQ and SCAN-D3. Ultimately, ISOSEQ and SCAN-D3, as you have seen before in this tutorial, we, will generate two outputs. The first is a DFF3 file containing the functional annotation for your isoforms, if you use the ISO of light option, and a filtered and curated DTF file, which is our experiment's uh, transcriptome. Finally, short reads from each sample should be mapped to the genome using this GTF, and subsequent isoform level quantification must be performed. And this matrix that you get is the, the expression matrix that is required to create a project in, in TAPAS. So this is what the, the overall design looks like. So uh, in order to, sorry, in order to create a project in TAPAS, we first need to run the application either by double clicking on the tapas.jar file or by running the java-jar command as shown in the slide. Before we proceed, it's been very important to locate the info files that were made available before the, tutor the tutorial. I, mean, I think Liz just shared the link with you via the chat and we will need to provide them uh, to TAPAS upon project creation, as I will just explain in a minute. After you start TAPAS, you must click on the new project button and it will open a new sub window for project creation. In the sub window, users need to provide the following information. First, a name for the project. Next, an annotation file. And to do this, you need to first specify the species that you're working with, if it's among the options available in TAPAS or other species if you're going to provide your own um, annotation file. And then select whether you'll be using one of TAPAS built-in files or providing your own. And in this case, uh, we will need to use this button to provide a path to the file. In the next section, we'll indicate the type of experimental design that we're going to be working with. In this case, we'll be working with a two-group comparison, but keep in mind that the other two designs that I described before are also available. Then we need to supply a path to the design file and a path to the isoform expression matrix. To correctly do this, you can always click on the help button, which provides more information about the format of the input files or any other available options for product creation. So um, two additional options are available um, for normalization and low count filtering. For row counts, TAPAS provides the option to use TMM normalization uh, before you create the project. However, users may apply their own batch effect correction or normalization method prior to loading their data into TAPAS. As long as you provide them as normalized or corrected recounts, other inputs such as TPMs or CPMs are not accepted by, by TAPAS. In addition, low expression isoforms can be filtered by using any user defined threshold that you wish to provide. And finally, users may provide an inclusion or exclusion list in order to select a subset of the isoforms for this new project without any need to manually filter your expression matrix or your annotation file. So this is very useful if you only wanna look at a subset of your isoforms or if you wanna exclude a given subset because you found out that they are not, um, they don't have good quality or for any other reasons. 
So before I continue, I'm going to demonstrate how to create a project using the provided info files, and then I'm going to leave you some time to create your own project. And since project creation is going to take a few minutes, we're going to leave Tapas running in the background, and I'm going to come back to the presentation, and then we'll be ready when, when the hands-on starts. So in order to open Tapas, you will need to have this. Sorry, I'm going to exit the presentation first. And as I said, you'll need to find your tapas.jar file. In my case, I have this in my bin folder under my home directory in the tapas 1.0.1 uh, folder. If I double click on tapas, um, the application should be open. It is here. And as I said before, you need to click on the new project option. We'll see the sub window. And when we do that, we're going to provide all the info that I was talking about before. First of all, the, um, the project name. I'm going to type new project, but you should type wherever. Um, and then we're going to provide the annotation data. As I said before, if you're going to use a user, one of the type of species, you can uh, select it here, for instance, Drosophila, and you have the Ensemble 90 release for Drosophila annotated. In our case, we're going to click on other species because we're going to provide our own annotation uh, file. It's an annotation file for mouse. But still, since I'm going to provide my own file, I'm going to click on other species. And now I need to provide a path for this annotation file. If you go to your home directory, uh, you should have a folder called, or whatever you put it, um, a folder called Tapas Predict Data. In it, there are four files. For the annotation, we need to provide the EFF3 file that I'm, I have selected here. And when I click on open, um, you'll see the path appear down here. Of course, you can always manually type it if you need to. Once we have done that, down here, I have the to select the type of experiment that I'm going to work with. In our case, it's a two group comparison. And I need to provide the design file and the input matrix. First, the design, we click on the button here on the right. And within the Tapas project data folder, I have an experimental design.tsv file. And I need to open it. And you'll see how the path appears. Next, we need to provide the matrix. And I'll do the same thing. And in this case, you need to provide the input matrix.tsv file, which contains the, the counts. And I'm, in my case, I'm going to select normalize, and I'm going to keep the, the default expression filter. But you can change the cutoff however you want. And finally, and this is very important, um, since this is a very big data set, we are going to use an inclusion list in order to only include a subset of the transcripts. I have selected like 2,000 isoforms. And in this manner, the analysis will be fast and very easy to run. Because you know, sometimes this kind of stuff with big transcriptomes can be very computationally intensive. So you need to select inclusion list, only include transcripts contained in inclusion list specified below, and provide a path. I provide, provided a file called experiment um, example transcripts.tsv, and this is the file that contains the different uh, transcript that we're going to be working with later. So now I think uh, you should just take a couple minutes to do what I just did. I'm going to keep sharing the screen for you to know what you have to input in each of the fields. And in, I think, a couple of minutes, if all of you have been, you know, have managed to click on OK and start creating your project, we should come back to your presentation to, to finish the lecture. So just go ahead, do that, and, you know, unmute the mic or whatever if you have any, any questions. I don't know if there have been any questions in, in the chat so far. OK, so one has been answering questions. Cool. Yeah, I'm taking care of your questions. Uh, you take care of the table. Thank you. So yeah, uh, I'll leave you one more minute. One more minute. Uh, please say you're OK when you're creating a project, or just give me a shout if you need any help with that.
So Katharina was uh, able to to create the project apparently. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, great. if you use the thumbs up or anything, you know, one of those icon options that Zoom has, I won't be able to see that because. So just let me know. In the meantime, um, I. You should also have downloaded um, the slides. I provided the link in the chat and it will be really useful for you to have them in front of you because during the hands-on, I'm gonna leave some time for you to play around with the different exercises, but there'll be moments where I'll be showing my screen and just doing stuff. And if you wanna have a look at the exercises yourselves, it's very useful to have downloaded the slides. Or if you wanna play around with the exercises after the tutorial. <laughs> okay, so well, if, if it's okay with everybody, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. I hope you cleared a uh, project. If not, you can finish it up while I go back to the PDF here. I'm gonna share my screen again. Sorry. Okay, so. To get acquainted with the software, I'm gonna briefly describe some of the main features of Tapas graphical interface. Um, so after you create a project, uh, you should see Tapas main window, which consists in three main areas. First, the control panel, uh, situated at the upper bar, the data panel at the top, and the visualization panel at the bottom. Um, the control panel contains <laughs> Three main areas. First, the projects button, which provides access either to extend projects and or gives you access to the option to create a new one. Uh, a series of analysis buttons here, each of which contains several analysis associated to each of Tapas analysis modules. And using these buttons, users can open results from already run analysis or run a new one. And finally, a search bar to filter the data and results table shown in the upper panel. If you click uh, in the option to run an analysis, this type of analysis parameter window will pop up. And in it, there will be analysis specific options to set parameters, select functional categories to analyze or provide a name or store the analysis results. In addition, each analysis window has its own help button. And I really encourage you to click on it and find more information about the analysis and its parameters. Up here, the data panel is designed to show tables, either expression matrices for different features, genes, transcripts, and CDS, which are uh, predictive proteins, or result tables for the different analysis, all of which can be opened simultaneously in different subtypes. Of note, TAPAS can open up up to three products simultaneously. So um, each of them will appear up here next to the, the green uh, tab where it says demo. And each of the projects will have a new color code so that you can distinguish them. The multi-option bar here on the left-hand side provides several options to view the log of the analysis that generated whatever table you're viewing, to filter the table by any of its, its columns, to export the table, to access plots and visualization summaries for the analysis, to change the significant threshold, threshold for the analysis, to rerun the analysis or to access a table specific help section that will explain the different columns and what they mean if you need to. And using the plus button on the right here, you can add or remove columns from the table. Uh, when you click on the graphics button on the left hand side bar in the upper panel, um, there will be analysis specific visualization op options uh, shown for you. Different visualization tabs will appear for each analysis graphics. And whenever you click on a gene level visualization uh, option for a gene, uh, several sub tabs showing different layers of information for the gene will be, will be accessed. Uh, for instance, uh, there's transcript annotation, protein annotation, uh, or expression charts, and several other options that you can explore later yourselves. In addition, the visualization panel contains its own sidebar 
on the left hand side with graphic specific options, which include, you know, viewing the log of the plots or exporting the image or even customizing the visualization in, in some cases. These, of course, are always analysis specific and plot specific as well. And finally, there are several ways in which users can access built in documentation in Tapas um, using the different help buttons that I'm showing here. Um, you'll be able to learn more about the plots, the tables, the analysis to aid the interpretation of the results. And I would really encourage you to, to skim through them because Tapas is a highly interactive and flexible tool. And we really encourage users to just play around with the options, couple the analysis in different ways, and navigate all of these built-in documentation points in order to better understand how to make the most of your data using FIT. Now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about Tapas analysis modules. Although the tool includes several analysis, these can be divided into three main modules, depending on the aims or the type of insight that they provide. The functional analysis module, sorry, the functional diversity module compares all isoforms for each gene in order to provide qualitative evaluations regarding the diversity of functional labels in the transcriptome. This FDA module therefore works as a tool to assess the level of variation that is generated in the transcriptome due to splicing and the functional categories for which variation is greater, but it does not take expression into account. The differential analysis module in turn evaluates expression changes for the three uh, main types of features supported by TAPAS, which are genes, transcripts, and CDS. And it uses traditional differential expression analysis as well as changes in isoform usage via the differential isoform usage analysis. This DIU can be run considering either transcript or protein isoforms. And importantly, all of these results can be very easily coupled with different types of functional and gene set enrichment analysis, which really assist biological interpretation. Um, importantly, TAPA supports enrichment for goal terms and pathways, but also for the rest of functional categories in the transcriptome. And when you couple these with DIU analysis, this provides very interesting information about the functional features that are most commonly present in genes regulated by, by alternative splicing, and also clues about the roles of this regulation in the biological setup of your, of your experiment. Finally, the feature analysis module is the most uh, comprehensive and diverse one, and is the one where we combine isoform level expression and functional annotations in order to estimate rates of inclusion and usage of functional elements across different conditions or, or time points, depending on your design. These analysis constitute the core of, of FIT and provide direct readouts on the functional consequences of alternative isoform expression. Um, TAPA support is a type of analysis for all the functional categories in the annotation but also for poly A sites and for changes in UTR length that are driven by differential isoform expression. Um, so that's it. We're going to move on to the hands-on now because uh, I think it would be best for you to understand the different modules if you play around and then we try and go through the results and interpret them ourselves. So I'm going to exit presentation now. We'll go back to Tapas and I have already created um, a, a project with the, the hands-on data for you to play around with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be displaying um, each of the exercises in the hands-on for a little bit and you should try to complete them yourselves. It should be easy given the information that I provided about the interface and the different types of analysis and I'm going to leave you like five minutes for you to complete the first one and when you have done that, uh, I'll open my own application and we are going to show the results tables. I'm going to give you a bit of an interpretation for the different results in the diversity module. And then we're going to come go to the next module and repeat the same, the same process. Um, so I don't know, do you have any, does anyone have any questions so far? I hope you're all with me still. So go ahead, open Tapas, uh, open the project that you just created and try to do these exercises regarding the functional diversity analysis. In the meantime, I'm gonna check the chat and I'm gonna see if anybody asked anything. Okay, no questions for now.
let us know when you were able to to run the analysis. Yeah, I'm counting on everybody being able to install and run Tapas correctly. And if you didn't at this point, just follow the tutorial and we can try and help you out with whatever installation issue you may still have via the Slack channel later uh, after the tutorial, if you're still interested in analyzing data with, with Tapas. Um, Liz, before we I start demonstrating, I was wondering how much time I have left for the hands-on. Yeah, so right now it is 10 minutes to my 9 a.m. and you have um, another at least 30 minutes, if not 40. Okay, great, thanks. And really, you know, where we have we have an hour and 10 minutes until the end of this tutorial and my lecture is very flexible. You know, it could be as short as five minutes, could be as long as 15, but I do okay. want to give people a little bit of a break, maybe like a five to 10 minute break before the last lecture. Okay, so 40 minutes max. Yeah, I'd say so. Sounds good. I think it has been something around four minutes already. Um, I don't know if you were able to run all of the analysis, but I'm gonna start demonstrating so you can interpret uh, the stuff you, you're seeing right now on your screen. So uh, the exercises said, just run a category level FDA analysis using two different criteria for variation. Um, I don't know to what extent this is kind of self-explanatory, but TAPAS can run two different types of functional diversity analysis. One is based on categories, and it will tell you uh, for each gene which global categories are varying, as you will see here. For instance, when you run a functional diversity analysis for a category, uh, in this case, I ask you to select every single functional category in your data. You should get this type of output. Uh, I have two tables for positional variation and for presence absence variation. Positional variation is when the genomic positions, um, the limiting, the, the functional feature change between the isoforms in one gene. And presence uh, has to do with complete absence 
of one of these functional features from at least one of the isoforms in the gene. So it's two different ways to look at your data, basically. Um, when you run a category level FDA, you get this type of table where you have the genes as rows and the different categories as columns. And the type of information that you can get is, for instance, let's consider this POP4 gene. For each of the global categories, you see that whether or not there is variation within the isoforms of that gene, and this will be labeled as not varying or varying, like I mean. If the, they don't have that type of feature, for instance, we see that for 5' UTR motive, there's nothing. It means that this gene has no 5' UTR motive annotation. One cool thing about Tapas is that at any time, I can right click on whatever gene and click on show gene data visualization. So I'm gonna do that for a second so that you see what I mean. I will see the pop for tab pop up. And if I use this plus button, I can visualize, for instance, the transcripts for that gene. And you can see what is happening. Uh, for instance, there is uh, uh, a UORF and there's, it says varying for the UORF category. And uh, exactly as the FDA analysis tells us, there's an UORF uh, motive in the first isoform, which is absent in the second due to this event where there is an exome skipping that partially disrupts the, these two and it's, they're no, no longer showing in the, in the second isoform. So this is the type of information that you get. Obviously, this is general for categories. So for instance, you have RP binding motives annotated. It's not varying, but you have RP in pink and we don't know what type of um, RNA binding protein site we're talking about. We just know that there is one and that it's not varying. But if you go to the gene level visualization, you will be able to know that this is, for instance, a U2AF2 um, RBP binding site that you have on the transcripts for the POP4 gene. So this is how you would interpret the results. If you want a global summary, you should click on the view result summary button here and you should see this type of table up here, down here. This is the main summary of the category level FDA analysis. And what this table, what this uh, bar plot is telling us is first, the percentage of multi isoform genes that have uh, this type of annotation, which is the total bar length. For instance, for three prime, uh, for instance, for, let's look at something more interesting. For post-translational modifications here, PTM, it says P because it's a protein feature. We see that there is a total of 401 genes that have a PTM annotated. However, the level of variation um, is told by the, the, the amount of the bar that is either light or dark. And if I leave my mouse here, I will see that the number of genes with a not varying protein um, uh, post, -translational, post translational modification, sorry, is 30% uh, more or less. This means that 70% of all genes that have a PTM annotated are varying, meaning that there is at least one isomorph that has or hasn't, doesn't have that, that motive. And it's the same for every category. So this is a very nice summary um, of the total extent of your annotation, as well as the, the amount of variation that can potentially be caused by splicing in your transcriptome. Uh, this is by genomic position, but if you open the same summary for presence absence, you'll see that it slightly changes. I'm going to do that now so that you see what I mean. Uh, just not checking on anything in particular, but you can see that the bar lengths have, have changed and that the, the amount of dark area has changed as well. And if I go to PTMs, for instance, you'll see that when I consider presence, absence instead of just position, the number percentage of varying genes goes slightly down to 42%. So this is, the, this is the type of insight that you can get with the category level FDA. In the case, case of the right-hand side plot, this does a pairwise comparison between the isoforms in each gene. And for each of these comparisons, it will tell you the number of pairs that have difference. Right, so it's the percentage of isoform pairs that are annotated for that category and the percentage of isoform pairs within those annotated that are varying. Just another different way to look at your data. I understand that the interpretation of this one is a bit harder. If you click on the help button here, you'll get a more detailed explanation of what the bars mean. And well, this is the type of interaction that I was talking about. Just go click on the help button, look at 
the documentation. And if you have any questions, we are always available via email, via GitHub, or via Slack as well. So this is the, the output for the category level FDA, but I also ask you to run uh, an ID level FDA. In this case, uh, you can only, well, you, I think you can, yeah, you can click multiple, click multiple categories, but I just asked you to do that for PFAN domains using both criteria, position and presence. When you do the analysis by ID, the type of table that you get is slightly different. I have my outputs in PFAM underscore press and PFAM underscore post. And in this case, you get an ID level um, table, which means that you have each feature ID contained in that category as rows, a description and a p-value and an adjusted p-value, and as well account for the number of genes that have variation for that um, PFAM domain and the number that you need. So if I rank that by the number of varying genes, I have that the pH domains, for instance, are the most varying in my, in my subset of isoforms that I selected for analysis. If I right click here, there's this option called drill down data where I'll see a table telling me all of the IDs for the genes that are annotated for that domain and the number that are varying, the number that are not varying. Um, so just, as I said, another way to look at this transcriptome level variation on a qualitative level. Let, let's not forget that we are not considering uh, expression here. If you did this and you run the ID level FDA for PFAM in using presence and position, you should be able to see this option, which says view combined ID results. And if you click on this, you'll see a list of the categories for which you, you run both. Uh, ID level using both criteria. If I click on OK, I'll see this type of table. I have the feature IDs, the PFAM IDs as rows. And in this case, I'm comparing the number of varying genes using position and presence. For instance, if I do the same ranking, I will see that I have protein kinases as the most varying when looking at genomic position, but the number of varying genes for genomic and for presence is different. One cool thing about this type of table is that I, we, we, generate, we can generate a summary. If I click on the graphics button and click on view results summary, a plot will appear down here containing for the top most varying um, PFAN domains, uh, the number that are varying regarding position and regarding presence. So here we can evaluate the, the amount of variation that is generated via the total disruption of the domain or partial disruption. For instance, let's say there's an exon skipping event that just removes part of the domain, but it doesn't, it's not removed entirely. For instance, there's, there are uh, domains such as protein kinase that are mostly varying due to position, that is just partially varying. However, for instance, the pH domains are more varying, they're, they're more subject to complete removal of the domain um, due to alternative splicing in our transcriptome. So, I think with that, I've finished. I don't know if there was anything else uh, regarding the FDA analysis. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but... Huh? What? Yeah. Oh. I just finished the entire first exercise. Um, now we're gonna go to uh, do, we're gonna, uh, change the order of things slightly because the differential feature inclusion uh, is the one that takes the most time. So we're gonna start running exercise four and then we're gonna go back to exercise two and I'm gonna leave you a few minutes for you to do stuff on your own. So if we open... Uh, oh, wait a minute. So um, are there any questions at this moment or have you been able to follow the, I mean, everybody is very silent, so I don't know if that means that everything is clear and perfect, or that it's been hard to to follow the exercises. Maybe you can provide some feedback. Yeah, if people can either type or probably easier for you is just to unmute yourself. And I think what I would be interested in is like we understand for some of you like this is really far downstream of where you are doing your analysis if you're just planning the software. I think maybe what you could use is this opportunity is to kind of ask us questions on like how tapas would affect your experimental design or there's something that 
right off the bat, you think like that like is a question that you want to know if it's already addressed by the software that we have presented today, because this is the last software that we are presenting. It's been clear, thank you. Good. Great. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so if nobody has any questions so far, uh, should I just continue with the next hands on exercise? Yes, thank you. Cool. So, as I said before, we're going to fast forward to the differential module. We're going to, sorry, we're going to skip to the feature module, we're going to quickly leave the differential module aside, which is the one that exp performs expression analysis. And I'm going to tell you how to run a DFI, and we're going to leave that running. Uh, if we go to the features uh, button up here, uh, there's, uh, there are three main options. One is the differential feature inclusion. One, the others are the differential polyannulation and UTR lengthening analysis, which I'll I'll leave for the another hands-on if there's time. The differential feature just performs expression-based uh, differential feature usage analysis. So we're going to select every single category that we have in our data using this, this, this button, check all. And you can either use genomic position or feature presence as your criteria. But keep in mind that there will be some categories that can only be evaluated using one of, of the two, for instance, uh, non-sense mediated decay obviously is a feature that is qualitatively annotated so you are only going to be able to tell um, the fi status using the presence criteria but you can always explore yourselves um, explore this yourselves um, later and if you have any questions just ask me through slack we're going to leave the method as exit because there's no other method and you should enter whatever name you you want to for instance the fi all and you should always click on filter minor isoforms. And this is very important because when it comes to very lowly, uh, what we consider to be minor isoforms, uh, are, have a very subtle change in expression. Sometimes the statistical test will yield a significant result when these change in, in the proportion of expression accumulated by each isoform is just very small. So we are not interested in those type of changes. So you should always click on this option to exclude very minor isoforms from your analysis. I like to use the proportion filtering uh, criteria where I just remove isoforms that have less than whatever proportion of the gene expression accumulated in at least one of the conditions. You can leave this as 0.2, go down to 0.1 or do whatever. So please um, fill this out, uh, uh, click on okay for it to start running. I'm not going to do it because I already have the results stored in my in my project. Um, and when you are done running, uh, come back with me. I'm going to continue. I'm going to just display exercise two for you, which is, has to do with the differential module. Is this differential button in the upper panel? And in this case, it's a bit longer, right? It has like eight different exercises. Don't worry if, if you don't have enough time to complete all of them. Just do as much as you can. After I'm going to show you the results, we're going to interpret them quickly. And these exercises are also meant for you to have a guide as to, um, to know what to look at when you have run an analysis, right? I've added stuff that has to do with looking at one specific matrix, matrix or filtering a table or trying to look for numbers regarding the results. These are meaningless now, but these exercises hopefully will help you analyze your own data and interpret the, the analysis when you do them. So again, I'm gonna leave you about five minutes to run these and hopefully I'll have enough time to do the interpretation of the differential analysis and at least show you one enrichment result and then go to the DFI for interpretation. And for that, I think that I will have um, completed my time.
Okay, sorry, I, I saw that Katharina got an error. Um, uh, okay, um, to me that looks like you might, you might have some missing R package, right? I don't know if you could install. Yes, I guess uh, that could be, um, I, I installed all the R packages uh, through tapas, so maybe something went wrong there. Should I just go back and reinstall all of them? Uh, not really. I think the one that usually gives us most the most problems is the Go DLM because it's the only one that we're not installing via um, via okay. CRAN or via Bioconductor. So if in the in the instruction PDF, you should have info on how to install that one. Uh, okay. Via I'll try again. Thank you so much. No worries. Otherwise, they'll, you can just run the line in the R terminal in the instruction PDF. You have the, the line to run the installation script and the installation script will just check which packages you already have and it will just install whatever packages are missing. So if you want to go do that and shouldn't take long if you can install almost everything via tapas. But. Okay, thank you. No worries. Um, so I think I'm going to go do the interpretation part because it's already uh, 10 past. I don't know how you are, how you all are doing. I hope you could run at least differential expression and DIU. And so I'm going to, I'm going to show you my own tapas. I'm going to move the presentation here so that I know what I'm. Okay, so um, the first exercise um, had to do with running differential expression analysis for gene. This is pretty straightforward. Um, you should see a table that tells you all of the genes, whether or not they were differentially expressed. You can change the significant threshold using this button. So if I make it a, um, a less stringent threshold, I should see some of them turn to not be, you can change that however you want. The filtering options for tables in Tapas are available via the second icon on the left hand side bar, and it will open this type of table of, of window for you. It's a row selection editor, and you can either add or remove from existing selections. I'm gonna just do quickly, uh, to the differential, the filtering based on differential expression status. But you can do that by gene name, by significance, by fold change, by mean expression, or by whatever other column you have on the table. If I filter, I'll see this type of window appear, which says selected 1,424 additional rows. This will be based on the, the threshold that I provided. This should be our differential expression result. You can also open the gene summary, the DE gene summary, using the, the results, um, the graphics button on the left-hand side. And if you click here, you should see this appear. It just gives you a summary of the genes that are DE and not DE, the number of them that have multiple transcripts, which leads me to the part where we add columns. You can add some of them, for instance, the chromosome or the strand in which they are. In this case, I, I was asking you to add the isoform column and try and see how many isoforms your DE genes have. You can play around with this as much as you can. And you can export the list using this 
this icon on the left-hand side, you can either export all table rows, gene IDs, or gene IDs with p-values, which is very useful if you want to run gene set enrichment, for instance, or do whatever thing that involves a rank list. And you can either include all data, on if, or if you do filtering or selection of some rows, you can only filter the, sorry, only export selected rows. So as I was saying before, all very, very flexible, very easy to just couple with other stuff outside of tapas or inside tapas. Um, running a differential isoform usage analysis should be uh, pretty easy. It, it look, looks very similar to the window uh, for the differential expression. The only thing is that you need to either select transcripts or CDS, which are predicted proteins, select their significance level, and the filtering of minor isoforms, as I told you before, just for the same reason. Uh, more information about this minor isoform filtering issue can be found in the TAPAS paper. The DIU table looks pretty similar to the differential expression. It tells you whether or not the gene is DIU, a uh, significance value, and it contains two additional fields that I'm going to go into in a minute. The first is the major isoform switching. What does it mean if, if a gene has switching? I'm just going to show you with an example. We're just going to open the AB1 gene, for instance, using the show gene data visualization option. If I go here, I have the AB1 um, window down in the visualization panel. And if I click on the plus button here, I should see the number of layers that I can explore for this gene. In this case, I'm going to open the expression charts. And we're going to look at what happens for expression uh, at the gene, transcript, and CDS level for this gene. It says that it has major isoform switching because if you look at the chart for transcripts, you can see that when the first condition, the major isoform is the purple one. If I leave my mouse here, it should tell me which isoform it is, the expression and the standard deviation. And in the second condition, the blue isoform just goes up to be the major one. This is a switching situation. It's the same type of example that I showed you in my presentation earlier. And in this case, we have switching for transcripts and for proteins. And regarding gene expression, we can compare. Uh, this is basically aggregation of all of the isoforms expression into total gene expression. And I can also leave my mouse here to know what exactly is the expression and the standard deviation, if I'm interested in that. I could also add uh, more columns to this table. For instance, the again, the isoforms for the gene. In this case, it has six isoforms. Um, the other metric that is interesting is total usage change. It's a ba basically a qualitative metric to try and know what the amount of exchange between isoforms in terms of expression is. And you have the formula for that in our, in our TAPAS paper. If I go to the summary for the, for the results and I click on the visualization button and I click on view results summary, I should see the DIU transcript summary appear here. And we have this type of plot where we can compare the log fold change for the gene and the percentage of usage change for its isoforms. This type of plot is very useful because you can also see whether or not they have switching and whether or not they are significantly DIU. And as you can see, the ones with major isoform switching, that is the blue ones, are generally the genes that have the most usage change. Um, and we see some labels for the top most DIU genes, uh, which could potentially be interesting candidates for validation or for further research. So this, has, this is all uh, that you can get out of the, the uh, differential module. Uh, there's another exercise that has to do with coupling these differential results with the enrichment modules, but we don't have that much time. So I think I'm going to demonstrate how you would do that and the type of output that you can get. And you can always try and do the exercises yourselves at home and, and contact me with any questions you may have. So any of these lists, the differential expression or the IU or whatever list that you obtain out of a TAPAS analysis can be exported. Uh, to be input into a functional enrichment analysis. One cool thing that we did is that we automatically enabled people to input differentially expressed genes, transcripts, or CDS into the enrichment analysis. But if you run, for instance, 
differential poly annihilation and you want to check enrichment for that, you can just select use list from file and input whatever. I mean, this virtually gives you access to whatever type of enrichment you can possibly imagine using also different backgrounds or just be as creative as you like to make the most of your data. If I select differential from isoform usage, uh, considering transcripts, and I use all genes as backgrounds, then I have to go down here and select which functional categories I'm interested in. And what, what I would recommend you do is to just click everything, because the cool thing about Tapas is you do, that you do not only depend on go terms or pathways, you can do functional enrichment for anything. Right, if I click on everything and just select your significance level, we do not recommend to change any of these parameters from default. But if you're interested in the interpretation, you can go to the help and try get more info about them if you want to play around with that too. If I, if I run this, which I already did, and I have the table here, I call it functional enrichment analysis for differentialized more usage results. I have a table that tells me different uh, annotation categories and whether or not they were significantly enriched in the subset of DIU genes. If I rank by significance, I, I have the, the list of significant categories that I obtained. I could filter, for instance, I could just select significant, um, significant here, significant yes, and I only get a, a list of a few of them here select. 23 additional rows, I click on OK, and this is my subset of, of enriched functional categories. If I uh, wanted to see a summary of this, because of course this is not very intuitive, I would click on the visualization. As you can see, it's, the mechanics are always the same. You generate a result, you view the, 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 the summary, and then you can go ahead and perform more analysis or couple that result with whatever other analysis you're interested in. Here I have these 23 categories summarized as an enrichment chart, which tells me what is enriched and what type of functional category it belongs to. For instance, I have some go terms. I have motives. Uh, in this case, it's NLS. If I leave my mouse here, I will get information about the number of test items that were contained in this category, the, the p-value uh, for the test, and I can export this image using the left-hand side button here, export enriched uh, feature start image. So um, one other cool thing, for instance, let's say if I were interested in NLS, because I know that that feature plays a big role in my experimental setup, I could go to the row about NLS here in the table and click on drill down data as I showed you before and just see the list of genes that have an, an NLS among the DIU genes and those that don't. And if I'm interested in this list, I can always uh, export it using the left-hand side export button here. The icons are always the same for the different functions, which is also really useful to explore the application yourselves. And I think this is all for the differential and for the enrichment modules. And now I think I'm gonna leave you one minute to try and do something related to the differential feature inclusion, which should have already finished. Remember, this is the, the part that we skipped to before. Uh, where I told you that it would take a bit longer to run the differential feature inclusion analysis, so you should leave it running in the background. If it has finished, just take a couple of minutes to read exercise four and try to do some of these. And right before we finish this hands-on session, I'm going to open the tab, the table myself and the different results and try to give you some insights into the interpretation of the BFI module. And if, again, if you have any questions, just you can type in the chat or you can uh, give me a shout.
So I'm taking a look at the time. It is now 25 after the hour. And I said I would start my lecture at 30, but I think, you know, we have, we still have 35 minutes till the end of the session. So what if we say, we'll come back, you know, at 35 after the hour. So in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. cause my lecture is probably somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll leave 10 minutes for people to kind of um, talk about things and give us some feedback. Okay. So hopefully you were able to run the DFI, which is the first exercise, the first part of exercise four, and at least open the results summary graphics um, in order for me to give you some quick interpretation of this type of analysis before the break. And if you're interested in doing anything else with Tapas, we can always talk about it um, offline. Um, I'm gonna just demonstrate explain the table, demonstrate the, how to open the results summary graphics and talk about the feature ID data visualization before we have the break. Okay, so if you run the analysis, DFI analysis, as I said, you should have an option here in view DFI results to open the result under whatever name you, you gave to it. If you click on this, you should see this type of table where I have Jesus rows and as you can see, I have multiple rows per gene. This is because the DFI analysis is run once for every feature for each gene. So that kind of explains why it is so time consuming. Um, and you should have a report of whether or not the features are DFI, as well as a significance estimation, the condition in which the feature is favored, whether or not there is switching and uh, a ratio for feature inclusion. Uh, so regarding whether or not a gene is DFI, this has to do where, with whether or not there is a significant change in expression between feature including and feature excluding isoforms. This looks very much like what I explained at the beginning of my presentation regarding that NLS example. So if I search for the CD NND1 gene, which is the one I demonstrated, I should be able to, you see that it has the NLS that I mentioned, it is DFI and there is switching. I'm going to show you why in a minute. If I open gene data visualization for that gene and I go to the expression charts, it, you see that there are four isoforms. And if I go to the protein view, you'll see that there are two, the, the green and, and blue that are highly expressed in neurons do not have the NLS and the others do have it, the NLS is this feature. So what the DFI does is pretty much summarize this with feature including and feature excluding isoforms. And this can be seen by right clicking and instead of clicking on gene data visualization, you should click on gene feature ID data visualization and you will see a summary of that expression. You see that with feature are highly expressed in oligodendrocytes, without feature are lowly expressed in oligodendrocytes. So when you look at the favored condition column, it says oligodendrocytes because it, it's, it has this, this, this form and then there is switching because the major isoform is the feature excluding one and it becomes the feature including one in the second condition. So this is the type of insight that you can get from BDFI analysis. However, obviously, this column now is very, has a lot of info, it's very messy, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, one way to look at a summary of this is opening the DFI summary, which tells you the percentages of features that are DFI in comparison to global transcriptome variation, which would be an FDA analysis, right? So we have situations such as, for instance, the post-translational modifications where DFI features have a higher percentage in comparison to the amount of varying 
uh, features just looking at quality variation in the transcriptome. And we do a statistical test for that. It's, the results are in the table. And if I go to PTMs, you should see that it is indeed significant, right? So we could, this, we could say that PTMs are a category that is being globally regulated by alternative splicing in this subset of, of isoforms and in this setting. Um, if you have more, you want to know more about this, you can click on the help button here on the left hand side and you'll see more info about what the plots contain and what the, how the test is done. And always there's the paper that contains way more information and details about all this. Um, if you're interested in looking at uh, the table in a more summarized way, if you go to features and you go to view DFI, there's an option to view the result summary. What this does is it collapses the table by, by feature ID and it gives you a count of the number of DFI um, feature IDs that, uh, that you have in your data as well as how many of them are favored in, NS, in, in, in each of the conditions that you have. So instead of having all of the genes that have NLS, for instance, for the NLS, I should see every single gene that has an NLS and there is a lot. And if I go to the result summary, I just know that there are 43 analysts that are DFI. And if I right click on that and I go to drill down, I see the specific genes that are DFI for that particular feature. So I don't know how everybody is doing. Hopefully by seeing me demonstrate and playing around with the applications yourselves, you're more or less getting the, a feeling of how Tapas works, where the different options are how to open the different summaries, the different tables, how to play around with the filtering, with the drill down. Um, and, and as you can see, the mechanics are very similar, even though you can run many different analysis here. Um, so with that, I think we are gonna conclude and 